We all have something to share. No share with Dr. Dave. Well, hello, and welcome to the Now Share with Dr. Dave podcast. I am Dr. Dave A. Cornelius, a.k.a. Dr. Dave, your host. Um, this is the third episode in this um, new series called Guiding Lean Portfolio Management, LPM, with Generative Leadership. Um, this series explores the benefits of using um, generative adaptive practices, which we call GAP, to implement LPM for organizations um, just seeking better insights into investments to deliver products and services and really to achieve the maximum business outcomes, right? And so this episode itself is going to just look at the one of the gap um, tenets called Focus on We, Willing and Enabled, and see how that merges with the Lean Portfolio Management uh, Organize um, Adoption Step to build resilient value streams. And value streams are just a, a team of teams and we will explore you know how aligning um portfolios around value stream fosters collaboration and team resilience and one of the key to this approach is the scale agile framework safe principle number 10 organizing around value and i've added to optimize um delivery uh, one of my first experiences with Value streams were many years ago, you know, when I was doing Six Sigma black belt work and, and for one of the, the four largest banks in the world. And the, the emphasis was identifying waste in, in this payment center. So we were able to figure out how we could save $16 million by optimizing and, and uh, you know, around um, the value by working with teams to really to, min to increase flow and to reduce waste. At that time, we used to use the word muda, a Japanese word for waste. And so today, we plan to discuss the benefits of value stream, which includes, you know, fewer hands off, um, faster learning, you know, higher productivity, and to address some of the challenges um, like leadership misalignment and resilience to change. And, you know, just additionally, you know, we highlight some of the safe, uh, lean, agile principles and strategies for co-creating environments that empower individuals, uh, promoting like a culture where everyone feels valued and enabled. So we're, we're going to have a great conversation today um, around how we start to leverage that safe principle number 10, organizing around value and see how that really like connects up with the gap. So this, it, it, it kind of looks like this one, you know, when we're going to have this conversation today, um, you, we, we talk about the LPM adoption organize. Um, and, and so we're talking about organizing around value. And when we put this together with the focus on we, there, there are two things that comes out, right? One of it is heart where we're open to being people centric. And the other one is about habits. In, where we're trying to influence behaviors for consistency. So th the whole idea is like, yeah, as we're organizing and we have leadership, you know, we want leadership to help co-create these amazing spaces where people could really thrive and, and succeed to help the organization, you know, achieves the maximum benefits um, what, through LPM and also to, to deliver some value. So today I have... Um, it, you know, one of those great minds is going to join me today in our conversation um, called uh, Phil Gardner. Phil, so glad that you're here today. Thank you for having me. It's it's exciting to be on here. You know, I I, I literally it's it's um, you know, it's, it's 540 local here. We're getting started uh, in the PM. And um, I did another talk on LPM this morning uh, at uh, where I was on deck at 440 a.m. <laughs> Um, for a, an auto, automobile manufacturer out of Germany um, that, that had, um, you know, leaders in, um, in India and a couple other places. And it was kind of a fireside chat with their execs about lean portfolio management. So I'm primed and ready to talk about LPM, although I can't think of a time when I'm not ready to talk about LPM. It, it has such a massive impact um, on things. And I, I love the fact that you're tying it in to leadership behaviors. Um, Please, uh, thank you for having me. No, you know, LPM is your stick, as, as um, our friend Luke would say, right? It's your stick. So 
you know, we, we like to just start off with singing, spoken word. You know, what do you have for us today uh, to get started? You know, I'm I'm not a um, I'm not a singer. Um, you know, and and one of the things that I find, especially over the last five seven years, you know, there's a Steve Jobs quote, right? Um, you know, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. And you know, I'm I'm blessed to love what I do and do what I love. And a lot of people can say that. And that passion really um, really comes across in what I do. Um, you know, I don't believe that I would be where I'm at if it wasn't for my involvement in the community. Um, you know, back in uh, 2015, went to Scotland, uh, was starry-eyed and idealistic, and got um, a lot of great insights from a huge amount of people that went before me. And that one experience, you know, really kind of changed everything for me. And, you know, it's funny, I, I, I don't come across as much like a U.S. consultant. Um, you know, meaning that it's not all about me. It's not all about, you know, the billable work. It's about this sustainability and, and what's there. On that note, there's another quote that I thought of, which was one of my favorite quotes by Churchill. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. And these days, a lot of the work I do um, certainly is helping people start safe off right. But there's a lot of work out there to you know, kind of reinvigorate, refresh, you know, it, it's people are doing their best and sometimes they're just missing, missing things just a little bit and a little tweak and, and they're off to the races. And so, you know, um, just all of this is a journey. And, and I, I, you know, if you listen to any of my LPM talks, LPM is a journey. There is no, hey, in 30 days, we want to have LPM up and running. Okay, great. I'm not the right guy for you because I don't believe that's possible. You know, you can accelerate it and get things going, but this is deep change. Um, so no yeah, singing, but there's a couple quotes. Yeah, no, those are beautiful. You know, I really enjoy those, you know, and as you brought up deep change, we're talking deep change throughout the organization from leadership down to, and I would even say down to from leadership to teams, right? And back, so we yeah. can create that hierarchy. Um, so let's just jump in and, and you know, you know, how do you help an organization um, who first decide to focus on organizing around um, value? So what are some of the, the initial steps you help some of your clients to get there? You know, it, it's so first off, I don't I don't usually I don't script anything. And so I don't even this is going to be those of you listening, um, you know, take it or leave it. I, I tend to be more of a, you know, just talk off the cuff. So, uh, Dr. Dave, if you need to rein me in for timing, let me know. Um, I do get on a roll sometimes. Um, so I think that the, the way that I look at LPM is there's 47, at least, you know, all these different ways you can start it. And I tend to, I would say go out of my way, but I, I don't, I don't encourage people to go all in with LPM all at once, right? Because there, there's so many different nuances there. And and with anything you do and with the way of working, you want it to stick. You know, it sticks because people have adopted new values and principles and their behaviors demonstrate they're using those values and principles to make decisions. And if you try and do everything at once, there's not time for that, for that, you know, depth of, of, of you know, of, of change, having all that stuff sink in. So when, when you, when you think about, organizing around value that the question is i guess if it's a safe implementation it's did you skip the value stream and art identification workshop and i don't have statistics but i will tell you that um even in my own my own first agile release train it's very difficult to get buy-in to get people to do this organ you know this this value stream art identification workshop but it's critical and uh, scaled agile in the community have invested heavily. You know, there's that. Um, uh, there's a whole set of a whole guide on Safe Studio for how to get it going. And there's a four-hour e-learning module just on on pitching it. And 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 you know, because it's such a for whatever reason, people struggle with it. Um, with LPM, that's one of my first questions. Have you ever done that before? And if they haven't, then that's a great opportunity to explore how value flows. 
most often the portfolio is built around responsible leaders in different areas, right? Sometimes it's functional areas. You know, I'm seeing that less and less these days. Now we're getting people that have shifted over to more of a product set, but they'll still have, I'm in charge of this product. I'm in charge of this product. I'm in charge of this product. And that by itself doesn't lead itself to flow. So really, when it comes to this, whether it's a safe implementation and we're using safe stuff, or they don't want to call it safe and we're just using value stream mapping principles, ultimately you get together in a room and you explore, you know, how do customers connect with you? What's that value exchange at the end? Um, what are the solutions and systems that you build that support that operational flow being able to occur, that concept of cash? And then you find ways to organize around value there. And so sometimes we do the we, we do the actual value stream workshop with safe. Sometimes we 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 do it, um, you know, on a Miro board or in a room. Um, I will tell you that. I I view it as. You know, the journey is almost as important in the destination. One of the things that I've started doing over the last five, six years is I do big room value stream and our identification or big room value stream mapping so that I've got, you know, finance, product, you know, quality, uh, dev, test, everybody in the room. And we break into small groups and explore what value looks like. And then they read out to the room. And what you see is, oh, I didn't think about that. Oh, I didn't think about that. And then you converge and now you have a really good picture. And along the way, the conversations that you get are really valuable. And I found it's a wonderful first step towards getting people not to think about organize around value as it's a safe principle, safe says do this, but as a way, as a concept that they're understanding the value and wow, that was really interesting. I thought that was one step. Dev says it's 15 steps or the developer you know, saying, I thought that was five steps, but it actually ends up being 14 or 15. And, you know, there's that shared understanding, that alignment that occurs. And so that's a, you know, kind of that, that, that theme of alignment, um, you know, but looking at that existing structure, I will also tell you, I'm, when I go in and do an executive workshop or something, um, I'll say, hey, please don't do a reorg right now. And they'll, yeah. oh, we just, we just did. That's why you're here, you know. So this idea of, you know, I'm somebody who has left companies because of the person I worked for, right? And not as much these days, I guess you, you learn to be a little more flexible, but ultimately people, people's boss changing, especially with high performers is a big impact. And so if you go in and do a massive reorg right before trying to change the way of working, you're spending a lot of your change currency and, and you're going to run out. And yeah. so, you know, my my approach with Safe is in organizing around value is you can set up a virtual organization that doesn't care who people work for. Have your people managers manage them, but get them together because the thing about a virtual organization is it's a lot easier to shift and change. And so, those are a couple of tenets that I would I would say kind of go along with that. No, that that's excellent. You know, and and the whole concept of doing a big room kind of uh, model. Um, for for doing um, the value stream art and you know and um, just the analysis work that's that's part of that you know I had a client and you know one of the things that he, that came up for him is like man I just didn't realize how complex this this thing was because I've just never seen it and and so I could see the great um, value of the visualization and and the smaller teams working together. Oh, and it's on that note, like you know, a couple of examples. Um... So I, I, whatever, whenever I facilitate a, a an in person event or even remote ones, I want to. There are there are insights and aha moments and uh oh moments that pop up in conversations, and so I always make a point of having a place to capture that. You know, an extra parking like, literally. Hey, there's the uh oh aha parking lot, right? Right. If, yeah. If if you hear that, go up there and throw it up there. We may not do anything with it, but it but better to have it not need it. And one of the things that in the value stream art identification workshop that, that SAFE has, the, the, the intent is not to do value stream mapping to look for waste and things like that. The intent is to understand the optimal way to organize your agile release trains and to organize your portfolio around value, et cetera. But you got people talking about flow, which means people are going to be talking about waste. They're going to be talking about bottlenecks. And so 
having a place to capture that. And what I found is it's also, it's a great way to get senior leaders involved. I'm thinking about this state-based health insurance company last year. And we had about 60 people in this, in this um, big, uh, big room um, doing the value stream identification workshop for their whole company. And what was interesting is the CIO, he, 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 I said, well, what, you know, what are the things that you got from this? He's like, he said, um, two or three months to get a data extract done. I'm like, what? So they had a little breakout to do some value stream mapping on an area that kept coming up about yeah. how many people are actually needed and, and et cetera, et cetera. And he said, this should take a few days and it's taken two or three months. And so in that particular client, as part of the transformation work to launch the arts, and he was engaged and supportive of the new way of working, but we also identified something that is going to keep him up at night. And so having those small wins and being able to find the perspective from the senior leaders during those events uh, gives them something that, that shows there's immediate term value and, and, and builds that belief in this. And in this case, the, the lesson was, hey, look, if we hadn't done this meeting, you wouldn't have learned that and we wouldn't have fixed it. But because we got everybody together and we're all talking, these things are bubbling up. And now you have some things that you can go fix. A similar example was in a, a, a personal investments company. Uh, this is a long time ago, like 2015, 2016. And um, they sent me to Research Triangle Park to fix that horrible development organization because it took them, it, it took them um, three to six months to do a personalization tag. Um, on, on the website. And, and it was hurting them because they had invested heavily in these major customer personas. They did amazing work becoming customer centric. It was awesome stuff, Re, you know, research based personas. It was, it was beautiful. But they found out that things weren't getting out there. And we did just good old value stream mapping and found that it took, on average, two to four months to get business to show up at the table and actually say what they wanted. Wow. And it was one of those things where no one quantified the the impact to lead time of rescheduling on average six times per request. You know, and so it's like you can see the we, we went back to emails and and, and built out a, a timeline based on these 12 or 15 sample email chains, you know, all the different emails on these different requests. And it was like, you know, November 22nd request comes in, you know, and then, you know, uh, February 22nd development starts. I mean, it was it was crazy. And what was so interesting is that it introduced this concept of fixing dev, getting more developers, doing work faster, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a more agile company, that you're going to have faster lead time. And all the lessons around organizing around value are tied back into that. So yeah. that tenth principle, which was added when say 5.0 came out, is is a is an important one. It's hard because there's a lot of things tied to how you're organized, and well, that's a that, that we, we'll, we'll pull that thread in a little bit. I want to stick to your stick to your agenda, not mine. No, 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 but no, that was good because it, you know it just naturally flowed into talking about collaboration and productivity. So you kind of covered that, and really, you know, it's just leaning more into you know, when we think of the role of leadership, and and I'm connecting this. Um, this gap focus on we, the willing and enabled, where willing is people are open to doing stuff and then they enabled is that we're giving them the skills. Um, you know, how does that help to support and sustain this value stream focused organization? So, so there's a couple things there, right? So one, from the perspective of structurally, from a systemic perspective, yeah, if you're organized around value, you've got a lot more opportunities for conversations. There's a lot less black boxes. You, you, you run into an issue, you already know who it is you can talk to and you have the conversation and you have, have that discussion, right? So in healthy systems where you have agile release trains or even larger scale solution trains, you don't go through a middleman. If a developer on one team has negotiated something with, a, with, with developers on another team, they just go have a conversation. It, there, there's not that that delay as you go through a project manager or through a, you know, through a people manager to have a conversation. You know, when I spent many years um, as senior director of development for a big telecom company or entertainment company now, but um, it was 
crazy to me that I would have a technical director working for me or, or even a team lead who would be told that they needed me to send an email to the senior director of QA because they weren't allowed to, you know, they weren't comfortable or they, they were told that they, you know, they were told by their contact in the other department that they had to go through, well, only a senior director can talk to a senior director, you know, only yeah. a director can talk to a director. And, you know, when you're organized around value and everybody's focused on that mission, things are different. And I, you know, I, I know we didn't, we didn't talk about my, my background or my bio, um, which is fine with me because I don't like talking about that stuff. But um, I will say that, that I spent a lot of years working with big, big corporations. And then I spent three plus years in the federal government space. Um, and then I came back to the, um, to the private sector. Now I'm, I'm hoping to do a little bit of both. But um, what's interesting is that when we think about the mission, um, when I was in the government space, whether it be, you know, with NASA, with Department of Defense, with Space and Missile System Center, with Federal Reserve, Reserve Thrift Investment Board, all these different agencies, the one thing that was true is that no matter what color your badge was, if you were a govy or if you were, if you were a contractor, you believed in the mission. Yeah. And when we talk about that willing and enabled side of things, the, the belief in the mission is a big part of it. And one of the things that leaders can absolutely do is help the people doing the work understand the mission, you know, and it's because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's worse than, you know, you hear the term, you know, you can't see the forest through the trees. Yep. Well, some of these developers, it's, I can't see the tree through the bark. I mean, they literally have, you know, what are you working on this week? Oh, JIRA 4398 and 4291, right? It's like, it's just, it's just these tasks, right? And that stifles innovation, that stifles engagement. And when, you know, LPM represents a great opportunity because part of the LPM journey is connecting the portfolio's vision and future state to the enterprise's strategy. So the enterprise is going here, we've got our missions, our values, all these different things that are happening for us as an enterprise. The enterprise executives work with the portfolio leaders, business owners, enterprise architect for a portfolio and come out with, okay, Here's a canvas that articulates what our current state of the portfolio is. This is this is today. This is reality today. Well, where do we want to go, right? What are those strategic themes, those objectives and key results we want to achieve that's going to differentiate us in the future? And how do we get there? Then they create a future state canvas that, that sets that postcard from the future. Now, it's not always appropriate to show a portfolio canvas with financials and potential partner and vendor changes and all sorts of things like that. But you can then take that and write a postcard from the future. I like right. to say it's your North Star. And so when you're organizing around value, it's important to understand what are the solutions and usually or even just one solution that this value stream provides. And that's a huge opportunity to 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 bridge that gap between, well, SAFE says organize around value and we're organized around products. OK, great. So you've got these three products. But. And a, at a higher whole product thinking perspective, that's kind of a solution. You provide a solution, right? You provide a cybersecurity solution. You've got identity access management. You've got threat management. You've got network-based firewall. Three separate products with three separate VPs or SVPs in charge of the PL. But at the end of the day, it's one solution. And right. so that's where you might have organizing around value on that. But, you know, Leaders model the behaviors, reflect that willingness and enablement. And um, I did a talk a few years ago at one of the SAFE summits about um, this, this cheesy name, like turbocharged SAFE with executive engagement. But the, the key message was you can't do well with SAFE without executive support. Yeah. But if you have executive engagement, it's a whole different experience. And I can track in most cases, you can track challenges with SAFE or less or Scrum at Scale or Nexus, you name it, back to executive support versus executive engagement. And if you have that engagement, when people see, because you, you said you know willingness, well, if I don't see the leaders mod modeling these behaviors and making decisions with these values and principles, then all I have is a belief in a process. And that becomes the focus. And, you know, when you hear people, you know, complain about safe, I, I kind of laugh because um, for me, 
the same thing that makes Scrum not work or Scrum at scale not work is the same thing that makes safe not work, right? People focusing on these, you know, this magical process that's going to make everything better. No, it's it's hard change. It's work you've got to do. So foster that supportive environment, that engagement, engaging environment, right? I mean, if like the, you know, Gemba Walk, you mentioned Muda, yeah. you know, yeah. Gemba yeah. Walk. I mean, it was interesting um, in the government sector. Uh, the first agile release train I helped with was at this joint Army Air, Ar Army Futures and Air Force program doing drone stuff and UAV. And um, long story short, a associate director, I think he's associate director, maybe a director from NASA, was going to be wanted to want to look at launching some arts. He and his staff visited, went to, in Huntsville, visited this joint U.S. Air Force Army program at PI planning at the INA to see a successful implementation of SAFE before they started their own journey. And so there's all these different ways that you can harness that, you know, and it's it we there's a definite benefit when you can start and learn what you're going to see. And, and it's tough in the private sector because, you know, com confidentiality and com competition and stuff. Um, I did hear about a, 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 one of the state-based insurance companies we worked with uh, was hosting Gemba for another state of the same brand. Yeah. And so, you know, completely different companies and corporations, but that that type of stuff really resonates. And so where I'm going with that is that when I went back to AT&T, and I can share this because it was presented at the 2018 Safe Summit by, by the AT&T person, um, they, the, the title of their talk was Unprecedented Leadership Engagement with Safe. And it was basically about getting senior business, like the chief marketing officer's attention yeah. with what they had done. And a big part of that was implementing LPM. And what, what was interesting is that it was all about these engaged leaders. They had something to lose and they, they were investing their credibility in this new way of working. And it was about the new way of working. It was about the business outcomes they were striving for. It wasn't about Someone says go implement safe, so we're going to implement safe because IT is telling us to. And those are two. I, I tend to make very dramatic examples. It's not always that black or white, but ultimately you got kind of these two ends: the business saying we want a new way of working because we want to accomplish these outcomes, and you've got we want to implement lean and agile because it's better than waterfall because somebody said so, right? Yeah. No, no, those are those are really good examples, and I like the fact that as, as you gave an example of, um, you know, someone from the Air Force coming, you know, the Gamba Walk, come and see, you know, it reminds me back in you know the early days of Safe when, um, I think one of the second or third implementation in San Diego, you know, we could actually go down to Mitchell International and go see a PI, you know, what PI planning looked like you know, back in those early days of really seeing how leaders participated and you could ask questions. And and to me, that was, that was really powerful, you know, as an introduction to what safe really looks like, because I actually got well, to see it's it. Inter interesting you say that though, because what yeah. does safe really look like, right? You know, yeah. I, I, I'm, you know, kind of things kind of come full circle, right? I, yep. uh, you know, there's a, a small set of people that really and I wouldn't call it mentoring because there was no for formal mentoring relationship. It was really that they were my phone of friends. Yeah. You know, and I was in over my skis working with some big, big corporations. And I, I had this epiphany along my way. I, I like, you know, I've got a book I'm half writing. Um, you know, I, I'm picking it back up after a few years, but it was from <laughs> from from great to pretty good. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, my journey as a as a as a you know coach and consultant. And when right. I started as a consultant, I was awesome. I mean, I was all of that. You know, three years in, I realized, oh, I'm not. <laughs> right. And and that, you know, I haven't lost that humility. And I'm I'm thankful for the customers I get to work with because that's how I learned. But where I was going with this is that when I meant I, I I've mentored two SPCTs now, you know, getting them all the way through that that SPCT program. I've got a third one. Uh, who's a you know by the end of the year he he he's gonna hope I believe he's gonna make it over the finish line, and um, along the way I found myself saying certain patterns over and over again. One of the things I say is, if you can see some examples of really great safe, and really not so great safe. Yeah, the reality is somewhere in between, and so understand that 
that this that any implementation of safe or any other um, you know framework is it, it's it's a framework, so it's going to be customized by intent. I've never seen a great example of safe 100% by the book, um, and that might just be you know self fulfilling prophecy because I don't believe in it by by the book. I mean, it's it's a simple framework that you can make very complicated, um, you know. But all, all that to say that you know when you think about it, um, keeping things simple and understanding why some of these things work. But I'll, I'll I'm, I told you I ramble, so I'm gonna stop there. No, no, no. It's, it's great conversation. So talk to me about some challenges that you know some of your clients had when uh, tr- kind of like transitioning to this value stream, you know, organization, and and how did you help them to like get beyond the the things that they're running into? Um, there's, there's a, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, (laughs) the elephant in the room sometimes, you know, and people are, you know, when I look at this, it just makes sense. And I think about some of the conversations I've had with senior finance leaders and, you know, because people tell me, well, finance isn't going to, you know, this whole value stream funding thing, you know, finance isn't going to ever get behind that. Well, it's interesting is when I've had one-on-one conversations with finance execs, they totally are good with it. Yep. But they're cynical. They don't believe that it'll be applied the way that we talk about. And I don't have any way of quantifying this, but what I will tell you is that in a lot of the clients I work with, there's a natural reticence to change the way you handle the portfolio because change is scary. A lot of stuff's on the table. And these people all mean well. There's no deception, I don't think, going on. It's just that that they know how to work the system they have. They know that, you know, they say what they're all the stuff that all the amazing stuff they're gonna do if you give them this money. They track these projects, they tell you at the end of the year how successful they were, and they get more money. And that's, you know, with within some some you know, that, that's a oversimplification, but that's kind of the flow, right? Oversell get the money, do the work, you know, state the success and then get more money. And that's kind of that pattern. And what happens if, if you say, Hey, we changed our mind. And I'll tell you that, that my client learned the hard way um, because they trusted me implicitly. And I was so excited because after they started applying things like leading indicators and really doing some deeper analysis of the opportunities they had in these business cases when they implemented LPM, it was a small portfolio of 78 million. And we identified 35 million um, in in projects that we didn't believe were gonna have the outcome that that was sold in the in the business case. And so ended up going back to finance and saying, hey, we want to repurpose this money for something else because we, we otherwise we'd waste it. Well, what did finance do? Thank you. We'll give it to somebody else. That's right. <laughs> right? And it took another, literally, I, I delayed my, my uh, I, I decided in May I was going to leave this company I was working at the time. I delayed until September because I was not, I was, you know, I was like a badger on this. I'm not going to see this all fall apart. And so we ended up, Literally, the, the you know, I stayed longer and we did a finance workshop. It was supposed to be in August. It got re- delayed to late September. So we finally did this finance workshop. And the outcome there was finance agreeing to a value stream funding model it, on a case-by-case basis. And but, but part of the challenges there is that there's this, there's not a lot of time to reflect on the metrics that we have. Sometimes there's no ability to measure things. Um, and even if we have the ability to measure, companies are trying so many different things in this in this modern workplace that you
maybe having a little bit of technical Yeah, it's just the wonderfulness of technology, how we, you know, sometimes just run into stuff and, um, and you know, we do our best. But, you know, as I wait for Phil to return, you know, there, there are some things that we can start to think about as finding some useful tips for, you know, the generative adaptive practice and leaders who are leaning into that as how they apply the focus on we, willing and enabled, um, to kind of like support LPM at this point in time. So one of them is, you know, foster open communication, um, empower teams, uh, provide adequate resources, you know, align goals with value streams. We maybe want to promote continuous improvement and um, thinking about how do we break down silos? Um, and as we go through the process of implementing the Agile Release Trained Arts, you know, how does we organize teams within that context? Um, Phil was talking about measuring. How do we use metrics to track progress in identified areas for improvement? And leadership engagement is critical to this. So, uh, you know, um, Phil was talking about that. And by getting the leaders involved, um, this is a greater opportunity for success. And let's, Phil is back. Okay. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about the, the blip there. I don't know if it's funny. Timing wise, the lawnmowers were outside my window in my office, so I don't know how the land, you know, how the the uh, yeah. land cables connected. But it's funny when you said there, there were problems that I literally could hear the mowers. I'm like, okay, never mind. It's probably too much of a leap. Anyway, yeah. I, I was going on and on. Yeah. Point being though is that you know there there when it comes to organizing around value, there's it, it's it notice I wasn't talking about the mechanics of running a, a values from art identification workshops. Right. I'm talking about the human elements and the things that motivate people. And my, my, what I, where I was going with that is that there may be things that aren't process related when it comes to the way of working and like lean and agile that you will encounter. So imagine if, if you're comp you're an executive and your compensation is tied to the, the performance of the projects for your solution, for your product. And now someone comes along, an agile coach and says, hey, we should do that. We should be one big value stream. And the three of you should be business owners for this one, this, this one value stream. Well, now I'm thinking, how do I deal with that? Or, hey, we should move to value stream funding where we don't fund projects. We fund the, we fund the factory, we fund the workers, we fund the train and bring the work to them. Well, now how do I control this? And it's, it's interesting is that individually, I haven't had anybody say, that's a horrible idea. I don't want to measure stuff. I don't want to make data-driven decisions. Systemically, there's still pushback. And, you know, that that's the challenge there. And what I found is in a larger enterprise scenario, find a small place where leaders are willing to be uncomfortable, willing to, to, to cash in their cred to try a new way of working, take a risk. And, and when it pays off, understand why it is and have those leaders be the ones sharing with others why it worked. I mean, one of the most powerful things when, when I went back to at t as a consultant and you know helping with this, with this cybersecurity company, I, I did one Gemba walk of their portfolio Kanban system that the executive team built themselves. I never did a second one. They did wow. it themselves. And I would come in sometimes, I come back from lunch and there's one of the SVPs with a group of people I've never met and they're walking the wall of their Kanban system at the portfolio level. And that's the kind of thing that people talk about. People in other groups, you hear them say, well, what if our leaders did that? And it was interesting because it was this sense of ownership 
from these business leaders and executives. They actually said, you know what? Let's not worry about business versus IT. They literally had this open workspace. And I, 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 I it was cool. I got to sit there sometimes, um, most days. And it's you know finance, operations, business, sales, marketing, all these senior execs sitting around this table. And they rolled up to different places, but they viewed this as our business. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that can't happen if you aren't willing to explore this idea of organizing around value. And so I'll, I'll pause there and, and let you get back to your your list of, of questions and things like no, that. No, the, the thing is you're, you're answering the questions as you're speaking, right? I mean, and, which is a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. So um, talk to me about the impact. Mm. You know uh, about those that type of organizational change of diff people with different via executives with different roles who are all connecting, all right, so, and, and really focus around a, a, a common outcome. Well, I'll tell you my, my my first quote, right? Do what you love, love what you do, right? Yeah. And one of the best compliments I ever got in my career. Uh, it's it's a funny story. Um, I was up in Boston working with. Uh, um, a group that does that did um, it was about three hundred fifty million dollar company, and I was working with the group that created the compensation and uh, commission systems. So you know the, the 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 SVP described it as I'm the guy who who has the briefcase with the codes in it. Yeah. Um, but um, the account manager from the consulting company I was working at the time came in. And he was checking in on me. You know how's how are things going with Phil? And he asked this one SVP, he's like, so how are things going with Phil? You know, oh, my husband thinks I'm cheating on him. And we're just like, what? What? <laughs> and she's wow. like no, 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 no. no. <laughs> she said, she goes, since this new way of working, he's noticed a change in me. My kids have noticed a change in me. I'm laughing more. I'm not up all night working. Life is different. And that gets me up in the morning, right? There's some people out there where profit gets them up in the morning. Here's the thing. It's two sides of the same coin, right? You know, I have, yeah. a, I have a person that I, I that I love working with uh, who does amazing things. And for him, profit is 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 huge. For me, profit is necessary if you're in the commercial sector. But without those types of stories, profit won't stay around for long, right? You know, as Dan Pink says, it, it, the profit motive becomes unmoored from the purpose motive. And so I love this idea of help joining people for a part of their journey and helping them have sustainable success with, with safe. That's my preferred scaling model, but there are other models out there that work just as well. Cause it's the same thing that makes them all work. Yeah. The point being though, is that when it comes to executive engagement, you know, I, I'll tell, I'll tell people, um, you know, a common pattern is Phil come in and help us get the business engaged. And what I'll usually say to them is usually an IT leader. And I'll say, are you ready for them to get engaged? And like, well, what do you mean? Well, if they go all in, you're going to be, you may be scrambling to keep up. So are you, are you sure you want that? Right. But you get the business engaged. And what I've learned over the years of working with business execs is that, and I, like I said, I make overly simplified examples. Business execs want to know three things. They have three questions. What am I going to get? When am I going to get it? And most importantly, do I believe you? And number three, when that answer becomes yes, life is different. So when we talk about, when we talk about the impact to people, like with that woman I mentioned, you know, that SVP at, at that investment firm, life is different. Life becomes different for the developers. You know, when, when someone can walk through the work area and people are willing to have a conversation or bring a suggestion up or, or ask a clarifying question on something that doesn't make sense, all of those things don't happen when you don't have leaders, you know, creating that open environment where they're they're encouraging that feedback. You know, I mentioned that that Army Army and Air Force art. One of the reasons that it was so successful was because they had a GS-15, the government exec, who um, in their very first PI planning event, he came in on day two and he rewarded people, called them out in front of the whole group for questioning him, for bringing things up, for seeing something and saying something because that was his biggest fear is that people wouldn't go to the program manager or program director at the contractor and it would never get to him. And he wanted that transparency. And so we talk about that willingness. 
creating that culture where you have that clear communication, you have that continuous feedback, right? You've got regular check-ins, you you have that sense of community and, and a shared purpose. You know, going back to SAFE's LPM model, there's a piece in there that sometimes people in class are like, well, why is that there? Underneath the, um, you know, LPM and SAFE is a series of collaborations. Right. There's the strategy investment funding collaboration, which everybody usually thinks about. There's the lean governance collaboration. And then there's the agile portfolio operations collaboration. In that one, you've got close collaboration between that guiding coalition, that LACE who's helping you move to the new way of working, your value management office, or we used to call it the, the Agile PMO, that's basically responsible for getting stuff done, right? But then you have a community of practice around the people that facilitate in safe, the people who serve, the release train engineers, the scrum masters. And in healthy LPM implementations, the it's not where the PMO or VMO is pushing down to the, to the through the lace and pushing down through the RTEs. Instead, they're asking, hey, community of practice, what patterns are you seeing? What do you need from us? And so when you when you start building that culture of inquisitiveness and making things, you know, making that type of 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 you know humble inquiry, so to speak, um, part of how you work, it, it it's a different way of working. And you know, there's a I'm gonna I'll, I'll tell you off my my thought here in a second, but for lean budget guardrails, my favorite is business owner engagement. Yeah. Because what you've got, and this there's a there's a um, you know an experience that impact that I'll quickly say my very first agile transformation, everybody celebrated it as a success. We had 30 coaches, it was huge scale. Everybody was, you know, we had a brand and you know a logo and all that stuff, and it was amazing, successful. And then the coaches left six months later, the entire business unit imploded. Mm. And the reason being, and I'm oversimplifying it, was that awesome scrum, but nothing scaled. Right. They had a traditional project management office that did red, yellow, green and was a gatekeeper to all reality of status. And the business owner role in safe, when you have LPM up and running as a guardrail, they're the ones that are actually seeing the solution of all. They're seeing the solution manifesting. They're seeing that they're seeing the way that this epic hypothesis that they that they were pitched on is manifesting. They're they're seeing that integrated solution coming about. And so you're not relying on a middleman to tell you if it's red, yellow, or green. You've got somebody at the table who has a vote on do we move forward with this, pivot, persevere, or stop, right. who's actually been seeing it as you go. And that's, that's you don't have that, the business owner that I described like that, sadly, isn't all the business owners out there. There's a lot of arts out there, or not, I can't say a lot, I can't quantify it, but there are arts out there where the business owner shows up for a half an hour or for an hour at PI planning once a quarter, you know, and says a few words, checks some boxes, and, and that's it, right? I'm talking about something completely different here. I'm talking about somebody just like in Toyota manufacturing, how a manager gets to know the people on the floor, right, and walks the floor, the business owner, the executive walks the teams, walks and, and is part of those events and is approachable and open and, and re encouraging the conversations, asking, what can I do to help enable you? What can I do to help? And anyway, I'll pause there because I kind of get in soapboxy. Uh, uh, no, that's cool. But, you know, um, we're, we're at time, and, and, you know, and, and um, let me just go ahead and close. So thank you so much for, for, um, Stay on the line. You know, we'll come back and we can talk after this. So let me just close this up. Um, so, hey, thank you for joining us in this episode of an organizing around value and fostering resilient teams, um, leveraging the generative adaptive practice gap, focused on we, willing and enabled. Um, we've had a, a, a great opportunity um, to explore this transformative power of aligning portfolios with value stream. And so in the next episode of Guiding Lean Portfolio Management with Generative Leadership, we're going to go into the, the next gap tenant where we talk about we trust you to achieve our goals and how that kind of intertwines with LPM, the strategized step, right? Where there's trust and bringing that, um, that aspect forward. So we'll just uncover how strategies help to build a culture of trust, empowerment, enabling teams to achieve some organizational goals. Um, 
So I just want also to let you know that the Knowledge Share um, with Dr. Dave podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, Audible, or wherever you get your podcasts. And, um, you know, I normally don't promote myself enough, but I'll say check out my latest book um, called Generative Leadership to Thrive. It's available on Amazon and it's available in Audible, Kindle, and print. And so just thank you for listening. And remember the journey uh, to excellence is it's, a, it's ongoing and every step taken um, has some abundance, um, has an abundance mindset to lead us to a thriving and generative organization. So with that, you know, I, I just wanted to bring Phil back and just said, hey, Phil, thank you. Any, any last words? You know, I might want to give you the final word before I, I we stop our live streaming. I would just say, you know, that don't wait for the right time to, to try some stuff with Lean Portfolio Management. Um, but understand that it's it's big change and you're going to have a different output if you've got people engaged and you're focusing on on you know looking at the opportunities as opposed to putting the process in place. While both can give you some value, one's going to be a crawl space from a ceiling perspective, the other one's going to be the you know the huge vaulted open cathedral ceilings as far as the potential benefit it has to your organization and importantly your people. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. Thank you. We all have something to share. No share with Dr. Dave.